the uh, calling the county commission back in order from recess from an <laughs> early meeting. We are having a hearing, public hearing, on the uh, city of Westover uh, petition and application uh, to annex a partial real estate containing 102.272 acres, more or less, by minor boundary adjustment pursuant to West Virginia Code, Chapter 8, Article 6, Section 5. Uh, the 102 acres is otherwise known as the mall property, in the short name. Um, before uh, we begin, I'm going to read over our public hearing guidelines. Um, we'll open the public hearing, and I, cited, and I cited, just cited the case. Uh, we will first uh, call on the petitioner. Uh, they will have an opportunity to make a presentation. Uh, we, we don't want to limit your presentation, but uh, I think both the, uh, all commissioners have agreed that you really don't have to recite everything that's contained in the written documents because we, we will we'll definitely all read those. Okay. Uh, then uh, after the Westover makes their presentation, the representative from the mall, uh, Mr. Malik, I see him here, uh, you, you will have an opportunity to make your presentation and the same applies to you in your written materials. Uh, any other things you want to present is, is fine. Uh, at that at that point, well, uh, throughout the presentation, commissioners will be allowed to ask any questions that they, they may, may come to mind. Uh, after both uh, both of the parties, is any other party here? Anyone else that considers themselves a party to this annexation? Okay. Um, after we do that. I will call on those who are in support of the petition to uh, rise uh, and uh, everyone that comes forward for the record, it's also being taped, should state their name, address, and if applicable, your position and what position you hold. Uh, like I know you, uh, Tim, will want to introduce the mayor and, and other people that West over as Mr. Malik will too. Uh, any in the public hearing after uh, as you after you rise, uh, you uh, will speak in support. Then those who are opposed, then I'll call on any any people that are opposed to the annexation. Again, name address uh, is relevant. The chairperson uh, may then grant the petitioner the right of rebuttal to any arguments presented uh, by the opposition, not to repeat anything, but just to address something that you may have not covered initially. Uh, each side will proceed without interruption by the other, and all arguments and pleadings will be addressed to the commission. No questioning or argument between individuals will be permitted. Any relevant ev evidence may be considered if it is the sort of evidence on which responsible persons are accustomed to rely in the conduct of serious affairs. Uh, the chairperson may exclude irrelevant or redundant testimony and may make such other rulings as may be necessary for the orderly conduct of proceedings, ensuring basic fairness and a full airing of the issues involved. In order to expedite the hearing, uh, uh, to expedite the conduct of the hearing, the chairperson may limit the amount of time, which I shall. Um, I'm, I'm going to limit to the, the, those who are here uh, speaking on behalf of the public in support. Uh, this does not apply to the two parties, but uh, I'm going to limit them to three minutes. If you, there's a compelling reason you can't get it done in three minutes, please let me know ahead of time. And I'll, I'll uh, judge then whether you need more than three minutes. The chairperson may also limit the speaker's testimony upon a particular issue in order to avoid repetitious and cumulative evidence. So if you're saying the same thing over and over again, even if though it's less than three minutes, I'll, I'll probably cut you off. After all evidence has been submitted to the commission, the commission shall close public participation for discussion prior to taking action but may ask questions of the uh, applicants, the petitioner, the respondent, or even persons in the audience pertaining to the matters under consideration. <coughs> uh, 
Okay, those are the rules of conduct, how we're going to conduct the public hearing. Uh, we are now, uh, Mr. Stranko, to the point of uh, as a petitioner. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Or Mayor, I'm sorry, I, I, I apologize, Lost Mayor. Mayor. <laughs> All right, got some things written down here I want to say is um, Dave Johnson, all, for the record. Oh, I'm sorry, for the record, I'm Dave Johnson, the mayor of the city of West New. Sorry about that. Thank you. I said there, listen to what you said. You got it since I got up here. <laughs> okay. First of all, if you can look at the slide there, I'd like to introduce our counselors, William Wilson, Al Yoakum, and Edie Vile are at large. Connor Kachakis, Janice Goodwin, and Leonard Smith are our first, second, and third ward uh, counselors. Okay, we'll move on to the annexation is in the best interest of Monongahela County. Our goal to improve the quality of life for our people both in and outside the city. With more and better public services, public safety, public works, senior and youth services and recreation. More and better public facilities, parks, green space, <coughs> excuse me, green space, sidewalks, street lightings. We estimate a cost of around $50 million to repair our legacy problems streets, sidewalks, parks, etc., and an unknown cost for new facilities. Improved business climate, public-private partnerships to support existing businesses and attract new businesses is a good example of the gateway that's just been added to Westover. Who do we serve? This shot here is for the, uh, that gives you a shot of, of the uh, medium household incomes. If you take a look at that, you can see how low they are. Council and I agree that our job is to represent all the people, not just investors for those with higher income. Mm -hmm. Tell me, tell me, can't me. Now they can't. Okay. Can. <laughs> Lower income families, the elderly and the young in particular need the support and services that a city can provide. We move on to the next slide. This, this, this is one example right here of one of our great needs is to make our city safely, walkable and bikeable. You see some of these pictures here where people have to walk. You see a whole family there trying to get across the street. And you can notice the snow on the ground there. These pictures were taken at different times of the year over the last couple of years. <laughs> the mall and its businesses are part of our community and should be full partners in the cost of our civic life. Let me take a moment to answer some commonly presented obje objections to our efforts. This is a big city, this is a big government takeover. Our city is run by a strong council, weak mayor, former governor. The six councilors and I introduced, six councilors I introduced are the governing body. Now I can't see my paper out. <laughs> are the governing body and administrative authority of our system. Each one is neighbor to their constituents and directly responsible to them for the work we do or don't do. This is not big government, but the opposite. Everyone has a say in our democracy. Number two, the mall is not in Westover. If the mall developers had built the mall further out in Laurel Point or in Brewston Mills or Core, they would have paid much less for the property. Glimpser chose our community and paid more for the property to enjoy our support and a ready supply of customers and workforce. Number three, the mall gets nothing out of annexation. The mall and its neighborhood are critical to the strength of our local economy. Excuse me. Even a casual survey of the area shows underdeveloped property and infrastructure that does not promote sustainable business development. We are focused on a strategy to reinvigorate the area, including the mall properties, Lawless Road, and South Dents Run. Because of the many different private interests in the area, this can only be done by sound municipal planning and support. Westover will waste the additional revenue. The Commission is well aware of our sad history of bad governance. Those days are gone. We have focused and we have focused in cooperative elected officials, qualified and motivated primary staff, and a workforce that is disciplined and hardworking. We are all focused on the same goal, to make Westover and Monongahela County a great place to live and work. While I neither have the power nor authority to commit to specific future projects, I can promise and guarantee that not a dime is wasted. Our entire community has input on how we manage public funds, and every dollar is spent for the public good. Additional tax liability will hurt the mall businesses. On the contrary, our research shows that the malls in West Virginia paying municipal taxes are flourishing. There is no evidence that local taxes harm these businesses and ample evidence that the additional revenue supports improved and less costly municipal services. 
And last, as I look around this room, I see people here that stand in opposition of our efforts. 90% or more of these people are already enjoying services provided by our city or the city of Morgantown. And having said that, I would like to introduce our chief of police. Please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, County Commission. My name is Rick Panico, Chief of Police of Westover. I've been in this job for approximately four months. I've lived in Westover quite a long time off and on. Uh, I do follow what's going on, and I do support this effort as a citizen of Westover. But now as chief, I have to look at it as a different way. I'm looking at it from a stance we haven't talked about too much, and that's going to be public safety. What of our interests as a city and as a community, county included, of the public safety interest that we would have with this annexation? Uh, I'm going to go over a couple points just to try to emphasize it and keep it streamlined here because we could go off in different directions with this. So we're going to try to keep it pretty simple. Uh, number one, our common, common purpose here is going to be public safety in general and how we basically look at how we're going to protect people and protect the services that are up there. Uh, first thing we're going to talk about is the current situation we have now. That's the current jurisdictional situation. Sheriff's Department and State Police handle most of the calls up there, if not all the calls up there. Uh, as a result, we're boarding this jurisdiction. We've had to do some policy changing to reflect this. We just can't run up every time there's a call because, number one, they're not in the city, and number two, we don't have legal jurisdiction to go up there and act in the city capacity as a police officer. So we've actually had to step back and redo our policies and procedures to reflect when and how we would go up there. Does that mean we don't go? No, we do go if there's a life uh, in danger. If there's something serious, we will respond up there. At the same time, we're not primary responders, but we end up being primary responders because we are right next door to these folks. We end up being the first one on the scene. Case in point, a couple months ago, we had an attempted abduction. Uh, the call was put out to state police and county, and you know, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'll be the first to tell you right now, county's got a rougher job than we do and their resources are a lot thinner than we have. So I'm not going to put this on anybody's head saying they're responsible. I'm saying that there's too much going on for what we have. As a result, we're having a case of redundancy here. I have a police department in the city right beside this mall, and we can't act on crimes in progress because we don't have jurisdiction. So now I'm expecting somebody to come from the county, which has limited resources. They're going to have to cross over and come into our territory to get through our territory to get up there to respond to a crime in progress. This attempted deduction was a fact that happened. We happened to be first on the scene. We didn't have jurisdiction, but it dealt with somebody's life. So we took the steps to secure the scene. We grabbed the people that were responsible, or someone responsible to the, pl the police arrived, in this case, state police arrived on scene, and we turned it over. And that was our job. But we, we felt a little bit short slighted because we could have done more. We were there already. Number two, improving patrolling and visibility. Three months ago, the mayor directed me to start doing a feasibility study on going up there and talking to people at the mall and finding out what their concerns were dealing with law enforcement and public safety. This I did. We went up and talked to people that work at the mall. We talked to managers in the mall. We talked to customers coming out of the mall. We talked to Lowe's and some of the businesses we have around the mall, and we found out one of the big problems we had was lack of visibility. It's not because the sheriffs or state police don't want to do it. They don't have the manpower resources to do it. We do. We're there. It's part of our routine. We just incorporate it or absorb it, what we do Right now, it's not a stretch. We're driving out the interstate and taking care of Gateway. Five minutes less, we're up in the mall. So we're saving time. Again, we're cutting out the net redundancy. Loss control support. As of this date, I've had three people that work in the mall as general managers or assistant managers approach me with concerns about loss and profit margins. Case in point, had a manager come over to my station and says, we've got a lot of property walking out of my store. What do we do? Call the sheriff's department. Well, you know, I understand we do call the Sheriff's Department, but we figured you guys could help us out because you're here. Well, he's right. We are there. And at the same time, we stood up, stepped up, and we said, listen, we'll provide lynch, loss prevention protection training to your people. We'll talk about interface between police department and your store employees. We'll do all that. There was no money involved. It was something we did because it's community. People come through Westover to get to this store. It's the least we can do. But we're doing that now as an ongoing progress type of thing without having it in our jurisdiction. Uh, improving public safety. Basically, what we're talking about here is if we do move in this direction, we're freeing up resources for other members of the county to step in and say, listen, we got some extra bodies now. We can patrol other areas that might be more of a concern. The mall is a pretty much standard deal. It's got stores. you got shoplifters. you got a lot of people coming through there with their families. We know how to handle that. It's not rocket science. We're police officers. We can deal with loss prevention. We can deal with crimes in progress up there. People in the county got to worry about back roads, back streets, no support, no backup coming to calls. We don't have to worry about that. We have Granville right next door. 
And we've already shown we work really well with Granville. We're like sort of right now a joint city when it comes to police forces. So we can, we can handle this. And of course, less burden on the sheriff for process and prosecute cases. We found the magistrate court always pretty much raising their eyes about not having enough people, not having enough uh, time to do what they have. Let's transfer some of this to the city court. We can do this at our city level just as well as you can at magistrate level. We'll get the job done prosecuting, but we'll take some of that burden off the, at, the, at the county level, and we can absorb that into the city. Now, will we make some money on it? Of course, but it's going to cost us money to do this. So there's nobody really making or losing money on this deal. We're prosecuting crimes that happen in our jurisdiction. What court it go to is irregardless. We're going to take care of that. And, of course, it all comes down to what do we consider the worth of a person that needs help? How fast do we have to say we got to be? Well, we're there. We're already there. We can do this. Sheriffs can do it as well. State police do it as well. Again, I'm not knocking them. They do a doggone good job of what they're doing, but they're limited by the resources and the amount of ground they got to cover. They got to come through Westover, in most cases, to get to this mall. We're already in Westover. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Chief. Tough act to follow. Thank you, Chief. <laughs> Um, I want to start with a, a couple of assumptions or axioms that, that I would hope the Commission would endorse. First, that a strong and vibrant urban core is in the best interest of the county. And you'll see data in a minute that shows you as of 2010, 89% of our population lives in urban areas of the county. 89% live in urban areas. The second axiom, the quality public infrastructure and quality services are in the best interest of Montegallia County. We're talking here about the quality of life of our citizens, of those people right there. You know, I've been blessed. I, I have a decent job and, and, and income, and I can buy a pretty nice uh, uh, standard of living for myself and my boys. Um, I wonder about those folks in that picture or the other pictures as well, what kind of, what kind of standard of living they're able to, to use. And we know that people with lower incomes depend on services from local government. Well, let me start uh, in the, the uh, macro view of what's going on in government, period, government, in our organization. Uh, from the federal level, here's the federal budget. This is from the uh, uh, U.S. Congressional uh, Research Bureau. This shows you uh, discretionary budget authority. Now, the defense is the black line on top. <laughs> the non-defense is where cities, counties, and states get their money, non-discretional, non or discretionary non-defense spending. You could, this peak right here is the President Obama's era program and the dip in GDP, because this is as a percentage of GDP. So that's an anomaly right there. But you see, trailing off into the future, the Congress is, is telling us that this is where uh, uh, the federal government is going to be spending uh, levels of non-defense discretionary budget. So in other words, uh, put simply, the money is disappearing from the federal level. Um, so both uh, uh, us in the city of Westover and every other city uh, across the country has got this challenge to look forward to. And the ramification of that, and this is again from the, uh, uh, the General Accounting Office, is this shows um, uh, the top line is non-health expenditure for state and local government. This is health expenditures, and this is, of course, the state spend, uh, spending more money under the uh, 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 Health Care Reform Act. Um, and this is uh, the, the local government uh, with diminished resources to spend um, on public uh, interests. Let's turn now, so we see the federal budget, and really, all you have to do is a casual familiarity of the news, you know that that's in fact what's happening with the federal budget. What about the state? Is the state available to help us? Well, here from the state budget office is a six-year projection of <coughs> our state's finances. And I'll get into more details about what we're losing and what's going away up here, but the important line is down here. Here's the estimated budget balance for the state of West Virginia. Starting at uh, year 2014, which is here, you see they're estimating a $21 million budget gap, $307 million budget gap in 2015, uh, 258, uh, $258 million in 2016, 157 in 2017, 114 in 2018. So the state's got no money either. Disappearing certainly uh, available to support public projects is going away. Here's what happened. Here's the inside of the numbers I just showed you, okay? Lottery funds are disappearing, uh, we estimate, by 33% uh, through fiscal year 2018. We're getting competition from border states. Business occupation tax. This is the state b &O tax, which is uh, levied against public utilities and uh, natural gas storage. 
couple of the very specific things. That's going away. We know the coal severance tax is going down uh, simply because of the coal industry. Uh, tobacco tax is going away, uh, dropping 5% uh, over those years. Corporate income and business franchise tax. This is an important note uh, as far as our business climate here in Montegaya County. We share, of course, the tax liabilities that are signed by the state. The corporations and businesses doing uh, a business in West Virginia, uh, the franchise tax will go to zero in 2014. And the corporate income tax is falling at 7% this year. It'll go to 6.5% next year. So those numbers are all on the bad side of the line as far as money available for public projects. Where, how are we going to make that up? Sales and use tax will have to increase by 12% and personal income tax by 33% uh, through the year 2018 to make up those gaps in the budget just to hold where we're at today in West Virginia. And uh, I can tell you that, that uh, the mayor and, and our city council in Westover aren't pleased with where we're at in West Virginia, and we need to do better. Now, so here's the backup on that corporate net income and business franchise tax. It is at a 23-year low in West Virginia, and you can see the trend down. This is where we're going to end up with corporate franchise and corporate income tax. So we are a business-friendly state. And we continue to cut corporate net income and business franchise taxes. <clears throat> and what does that cost us as a state to do that? Here are the budget cuts um, and budget shortfalls in, in millions of dollars with business taxes. So you see, if we look at the fiscal year 2017, but for the business tax cuts, we would not have a budget gap. 2018, same way. Uh, here's 2015, 2016, where we do have budget gaps, regardless of the business tax cut. But we could be on the positive side of the ledger, but we've decided as a state to make this investment to attract businesses in West Virginia. I'm not criticizing. I'm presenting facts to the commission to let you know that the end result is this. <clears throat> this is what the, uh, uh, the GAO says in uh, their projections of the our state and local government <laughs> operating balances of percentage, as a percentage of the GDP. Again, a trend that shows you that from 2014, we are nothing but negative, a negative balance or a deficit in both state and local government across the nation, and certainly the case here as well. So that's it. Let me, the mayor said, okay, $50 million in legacy problems. $50 million. That's not even positioning us for the future. That's just fixing the mistakes of the past, getting those people off of the, 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 uh, the berm of the road putting the sidewalk in there, making the city walkable and bikeable. Uh, that's, like a, that's a legacy problem, right? So we know even addressing the problems we have today, we're going to be in a deficit. We are in a deficit. Now, what happens going forward? Here's the population trends in Montegaya County. In 2010, we were at about 96,000. Um, we estimate, uh, and this is from the U.S. Census, and then the forward estimations from WVU Business and Economics Research, that the county population in 2040 is going to be about 138,000 people or 43.5 percent increase over where we're at today. So not only do we have 50, uh, 50 million dollars in legacy problems, we've got what? 40 to almost 42,000 more people moving into Montegaya County. Where are those people going to go? <coughs> here's the trend and here's where we say where uh, the WVU Business and Economics says we'll be in, uh, in 2040. Now the slide's a little low here. I wanted to make sure you saw this, commissioners. As part of our county population, you can see that, as I said before, in 2010, 89% of our population is in urban areas, 11% in non-urban areas. So 101% of our growth has been in the urban areas, and we've actually lost population in non-urban areas in the last 10 years from the, most, uh, the 2010 U.S. Census. So the strength of our county... And the population is focused on our urban areas. What does that mean for us? What does that mean in a practical sense? Well, when you crunch the numbers and figure out how much land is going to be consumed with those 42,000 new county residents, it's 0.21 acres per person. And we do that by historical land consumption. We've calculated 10-year growth areas and shown how much area has been developed in those population changes got the rates and averaged those to 0.21 acres per person. So we're talking about 8,800 acres of land consumption if every one of those people come in and develop a new piece of green space into living space. Obviously, 
obviously that's not what we want in Montegan County. That's what we call sprawl. That's what we call disappearing green space, disappearing farmland. What we have to do in our estimation is make sure that 42,000 new county residents come into a, an area that has a strong, well-financed, well-run urban core where they'll want to live, redevelop the brownfields, redevelop the old sites, and concentrate our population um, so that our beautiful countryside will be protected and continued into the foreseeable future. I want to also anticipate a, an argument uh, that we've heard before about this is bad for our business, uh, th this is bad for the mall's business. And the only way we can figure this out is to benchmark this. So what I've presented to you here are two malls, two covered malls in West Virginia. In the village of Barbersville, within the municipal limits of Barbersville, there is the Huntington Mall. A misnomer because they're actually in Barbersville. Uh, right up against the city limits of Bluefield, but not in the city, is the Mercer Mall. Mercer Mall, therefore, does not pay local taxes. The Huntington Mall does pay local taxes. Let's see what the impact of those malls are, uh, or the mall in Huntington is, on the village of Barbersville, the mall in Barbersville. Um, they have about 4,000 people in 2010. Their budget is about $5.3 million. So they're about the same size as, as us in Westover, about 4,000 people, right? Their budget's $5.3 million. Our budget in 2012-2013 uh, was $3.1 million. How'd they get the extra money? $3.1 million in B&O taxes. $3.1 million, 58.58% of the budget in Barbersville is from B&O taxes. In Westover, 34.8% of our budget is from B&O taxes. Okay, so that significant difference right there. Now, how does that fall out to the individual living in the municipality? In Barbersville, this average citizen uh, uh, pays $46 of, of municipal fees, or per capita, eleven sixty per year, eleven sixty per cap, per hundred per year. In West Arbor, they pay sixty seven seventy nine. In Bluefield, which has, does not have a mall paying B&O taxes, they pay one hundred and seventy seven thirty five. And you can see in the bottom line, and again, you have it on your printout copies, the total amount allocated to what we call citizen services in Barbersville, they spend uh, one thousand nineteen dollars per capita on citizen services libraries, community centers, pools, on and on. In Westover, we spend $600 uh, per capita on citizen services. In Bluefield, they spend $562 per capita for citizen services. Now, we know that the occupation, occupation, uh, occupation we know, <laughs> let's try again, that 100% of the retail spaces in the Huntington Mall are occupied. The anchor stores are occupied. They have a gross leasing area of 1.5 a million square feet, uh, and they're paying B&O taxes to a well-financed uh, community of Barbersville. Um, and the citizens of Barbersville pay less out of their pocket for those services. Uh, the Mercer Mall, again, not participating in local government, um, has, uh, uh, let's see, 24 retail spaces unoccupied, one, an one anchor space unoccupied. I had to hear the Grand Central Mall because this, interestingly, is a glimpse of property in Vienna which is the town right next to Parkersburg. It is in the municipal limits of Vienna. They do pay B&O taxes. I chose Barbersville as the benchmark because I had more data on Barbersville. But again, here's a Grand Central Mall owned by the, the same uh, people that own the mall here. Um, and they have uh, 12 uh, retail spaces unoccupied. All their anchor spaces are full. Um, so the, the argument that this hurts our business simply doesn't hold water. You see by this data that we are uh, approaching what, what I would call a perfect storm of municipal fiscal stress. A perfect storm in that we got significant legacy problems in Westover. And, and you gentlemen have been here longer than most. You know what the problems are in Westover. We've got about 20% of our city has got sidewalks. We've got public park needs. We've got uh, a lot of public infrastructure needs. Uh, so we've got legacy problems, number one. We've got demands for future growth. I showed you the numbers of what's coming to Montegallia County, 43% growth to 2040. So legacy problems looking backwards, demands looking forward, and we've got disappearing support for local government from the federal and the state level. So we are left with a conundrum. We cannot continue to do business the same way, which is that we can give 
some of our local businesses a pass on participating in the cost of civic life, make others pay, and in the end, who suffers? Who suffers are those people that the mayor talked about earlier in the presentation that are trying to raise a family on a median household income in Westover of, let's say, $43,393. And that's a median. That means that's the middle point. Where do those people go for the services they need? Where does a senior citizen who is over 64 with a median income of $28,000 a year uh, go for recreation or socialization? Uh, uh, where do we go? Where do, who do we turn to? Is the county government ready to participate in those costs? It's not your job. Is the state government ready to participate in those costs? Not their job. Whose job is it in West Virginia to provide those services, those public services to our citizens that make their everyday life better? Local government. What we're asking of the mall is to participate in the cost of civic life to make our citizens' lives better. And if that's not in the best interest of Montegay County, I, frankly, gentlemen, I don't know what is. Um, I wanted to go through the proposed findings of fact. I, I will not uh, do that uh, uh, pursuant to the president's instruction that we won't be redundant. We'll present you a written document with proposed conclusions and findings. Um, but I will say this. It, this is undoubtedly in the best interest of the county as a whole, for them all to pay their fair share of the cost of our civic life, civic life. And in fact, in the three plus years I've been studying and working on this, I've not heard one single fact to suggest otherwise. And I'm looking forward to uh, uh, my colleague in the bar's uh, presentation to hear exactly why it is that the mall participating in the cost of local government is not in the best interest of Montegay County as a whole. I'll pause there and thank you for your attention, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Stranger. Uh, is, does that conclude uh, yes, sir, that West over West over Mayor? Yes. West over for the uh, Mr. Malik, uh, on behalf of them all, thank you. introduce yourself and your people, please. My name is Phil Malik. I'm here on behalf of the Morgantown Mall and the Morgantown Commons ownership. Those are two different entities and two different parcels that are the subject of the annexation petition. With me here tonight, once again, as he has been at all of the proceedings in these last several years, is Mr. Harry Grandin, who's the general manager at the mall. We have, uh, we, we take seriously your not an admonition, but a general request that we not be redundant and that we not take up too much time. I know there are people here who don't have the time to write letters, who don't have the time to put together PowerPoints, but who do wish to be uh, heard. So we will attempt to take as uh, little of your time this evening as, as uh, we can. Uh, however, I would uh, encourage you to ask any question so that you can uh, fully appreciate our position. And, and I'll do this again at the end. I would respectfully urge you to read the written submissions in their entirety that we've uh, made available to you for your consideration in this proceeding. The first is, uh, was submitted by letter dated August the 26th, 2013, and it came with a rather lengthy uh, binding. I want to read the, the body of the letter. It's certainly not uh, any but a couple of snippets of the attachments to it so that those in attendance can be appreciative of the mall's position. <coughs> Dear President Callan and Commissioners Bartello and Bloom, on behalf of Morgantown Mall Associates Limited Partnership and Morgantown Commons Limited Partnership, we wish to document several objections to and comment on the petition and application that is the subject of your enclosed order, apparently prepared by Westover's legal counsel. Westover has tried repeatedly to involuntarily annex our client's real estate into its municipal boundaries. Two of those efforts, denied by you, later proceeded to the circuit court in civil action numbers 11 CAP5 and 13 AA1. Although you have refused our repeated requests to take no further action pending final disposition of the still pending civil action number 13 AA1, we reiterate that this is all that you need to do or should do for now, which would prevent the needless expenditure of time and money by our clients by Westover and by the county. The rest of this letter and its several enclosures are submitted in the event that you continue to proceed. 
Your enclosed order fails to specify which of Westover's two most recent submissions you are now considering the petition and application submitted by Westover on July 17, or the <clears throat> revised petition submitted on July 24. If you are considering the former, then the document plainly misstates West Virginia law, as Westover has already acknowledged, which apparently misinformed the Westover City Council. If you are considering the latter, then the Westover Council, to our knowledge, never approved its submission, which was therefore an ultra vires act. In either event, the request should be denied for that reason alone. Otherwise, our client's position as to both the law and the facts is well documented. We submit as part of this record for your consideration, and then the letter goes on to list the 16 exhibits that, that are appended to it. I want to refer to one of those in just a moment. But I first want to note for the record that we've also submitted a letter dated September the 3rd, 2013. Dear President Callan and Commissioners Bartolo and Bloom, supplementing our August 26th letter and is contemplated in its exhibits 15 and 16, we received today from Westover a further response to our Freedom of Information Act request and this afternoon obtained and examined 53 pages of invoices from Mr. Stranko's firms. They've been redacted of all information except date of service and fee and expenses and some were rendered to Westover's sanitary board. However, Assuming that the redaction is correct and subject to any corrective information that Westover may submit, we represent to you that, one, Westover incurred $9,596 in legal fees, whether or not yet paid, arising from the October 10, 2010 resolution and annexation petition application that this commission denied on January 26, 2011. Two, Westover incurred $21,462 in legal fees, whether or not yet paid, for civil action number 11, CAP5, Circuit Court of Montegalia County. Three, Westover incurred $15,176.37 in legal fees and expenses, whether or not yet paid, arising from the May 7, 2012 resolution and annexation petition application that the commission denied on December 19, 2012. Four, Westover has thus far incurred $20,123.70 in legal fees and expenses, whether or not yet paid, for civil action number 13 AA1, Circuit Court of Montegalia County. That's the action, I'll, I'll uh, add parenthetically, that's still pending. This total, $66,358.07, is enough to pay for eight or nine elections under West Virginia Code Section 8. 6 2 based on Westover's estimates. Even if the Commission otherwise chooses to continue accepting Westover's misreading of Section 865, the Commission can and should determine that, quote, the annexation could be efficiently and cost effectively accomplished under Section 2 or 4 of this article, end quote, within the meaning of Section 865, subsection D. Oops. I have a copy here. Who's the custodian of your uh, your records for the hearing this evening? Uh, I'd like to present to uh, her for your record the redacted invoices that are summarized okay. in that letter. Although some of the attachments to our uh, August 26 letter are now two or more years old, they're just as valid and that's why we resubmit them for your consideration for purposes of this annexation proceeding. And we, we know that you'll give them every bit the consideration that you would if I were to read them all aloud to you again tonight. They're very pertinent, not only to what you heard in round one, not only what the commission heard in round two, but what we heard earlier this evening. I just made a few notes as I was listening to the several speakers on behalf of Westover. Both Mayor Johnson and Mr. Stranko made mention of other malls. That's been addressed before, and you will see that it has, and we ask you to see it again for purposes of your consideration of this petition in our November 30, 2010 letter that's Exhibit B4. I will read that paragraph from 
page three of that letter. Mr. Wilson, a member of Westover City Council, stated at your hearing that Westover's petition was similar to those in recent years of Granville and Morgantown that involved commercial properties. Our research has confirmed that both Granville's annexation of the University Town Center property and Morgantown's more recent annexation of property that includes a Walmart store, both came at the request of the affected landowners. Your orders and related public documents confirm that those property owners and municipal officials had met, worked together, and agreed to incorporation before the municipalities came to you with their annexation petitions. Westover and our clients 20 years ago were unable to reach such an agreement, thus requiring our clients to construct the sewer collection facilities addressed above. Now, Westover has foregone any such effort and is attempting to forcibly annex the property. None of the malls that are uh, exemplified in the submission that was uh, reviewed by Mayor Johnson and, and Mr. Stranko has been represented as being involuntarily annexed as a purported minor boundary adjustment under H65 of the West Virginia Code. Mr. Sell in round two, and he's here tonight, and I'm sure he's going to ask you to consider the same history again, documented thoroughly how that relationship could but didn't germinate when the mall was built. Under those circumstances, it is unfair and potentially uh, would lead you to a, 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 an, an ill-informed decision if you were to assume that this happens all of the time and all these other malls they've showed you in the screen. It's never happened anywhere. We also heard this evening about public safety. That very letter, November 30, 2010, page three, that I just read one paragraph from also addresses that argument because it was made in the first two rounds as well. Quote, as to other public services, annexation would result in no change in trash services, no change in water service, and stormwater from the mall and the commons continuing to be directed into existing retention ponds constructed by our clients. Fire services would still be provided to the Morgantown Mall by the Westover, Granville, and Star City VFDs. The Westover VFD is deemed the primary responder to the mall and commons, but that does not mandate an involuntary annexation of our client's property. The dispatch of ambulance services is coordinated through MECA 911 and is also working well. The only public service that could change upon annexation is police protection, but Westover's arguments based on public safety are also make weight. Police services are generally provided to the targeted property by the Montegalia County Sheriff's Department and the West Virginia State Police, and neither of these agencies has, to our client's knowledge, ever indicated any concern about their provision of those services. Westover police have responded on rare occasions, but that is as it should be. Obviously, a municipality's corporate boundaries must end somewhere, and adjacent areas will be served as circumstances warrant from time to time. But to suggest that there is presently a crime or policing problem at the Morgantown Mall or Morgantown Commons is simply incorrect, end quote. And we heard nothing that makes the argument any better this time, the argument that failed the last two times. Finally, I took note of the, uh, the detail and the emphasis given by Mr. Stranko to the financial data. If you boil all of that down, clearly West Over expects to come out of head through the imposition and collection of taxes from those who do business at the mall and the commons. They've been very candid. They will take in more than they will spend rendering whatever additional services they say they will as a result of this annexation. This is about nothing but additional tax revenue for Westover. That's not what the statutes contemplate, and we don't think it should be uh, the basis for you to render a decision contrary to those of your two predecessor commissions here in Montegalia County. Mention was made about the submission of proposed findings and conclusions we will be happy to submit anything that you ask us to once you've done closing your record and your consideration of this matter. But I, at this point, we would simply commend to you the findings and conclusions that the county commission rendered at round two, the order that is presently before the circuit court of Montegalia County 
and 13 AA1. We believe that that was correctly decided. We believe that when it's fully and finally litigated, it will be sustained. We, again, respectfully urge you to take no further action pending the disposition of that case. I'm ready for any questions you have of me on behalf of our clients. I have one further submission that we'd like to make tonight. We have a, a petition, and I've already given a copy to uh, Mr. Simonton, Mr. Stranko's colleague, signed by many of the businesses at both the Morgantown Mall and the last sheet businesses at the Morgantown Commons. And I would like to read the very short body of the petition before I give them to your okay. records custodian. Petition against Westover annexation. We, the undersigned, are merchants at Morgantown Mall and are opposed to the proposed annexation of the mall property by the city of Westover. We oppose any additional tax that will increase our cost of operating our business. We feel the only beneficiary of the increase in revenues will be the city of Westover and not us, the merchants of Morgantown Mall. Some of us previously submitted comments in writing or orally when the county commission considered Westover's request in 2012. We reiterate those comments and ask that they be considered in evaluating Westover's current petition. And I would note that the record of the comments that you received at the hearings last year are part of our submission here uh, again tonight, the, behind the letter dated August 26, 2013. That concludes my remarks. You want to present the petition to Janet? Yes. And I, should I stay up here for any questions, or do oh, you well, have any for well, me? Well, you have any questions for Mr. Mellon? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, are you representing the merchants in the mall? No. We represent the... Uh, the, the uh, property owners, the, okay. the uh, people who own the real estate that are the target of the annexation. But you're presenting a petition on their behalf? I'm presenting their petition. And that's not representing them? I'm not representing them, I'm presenting their petition. Okay. Would you rather that they mail it in? I mean, no, I, no. I, the reason I ask you that is because in the beginning of this process, uh, I think it's I think it's incumbent upon uh, the mall to declare whether or not they're representing the merchants, and there's also, if, if uh, you could represent the merchants by statute, but uh, if you uh, decline to do that, then you can. They have to represent themselves. I've not been asked to represent any of the merchants at the mall or the common. I can't represent anyone who doesn't ask for my re uh, representation and, and I accept their request for that representation. I'm just trying to get it clarified whether you're representing it, it remains the case. It, it remains the case, Commissioner Bartolo. We do not represent yeah. its lawyers, <coughs> the, uh, the merchants at the Mall of the Commons. You, you make reference to prior decisions regarding annexation, and, and I think it's a well-known fact that probably one of the biggest issues that this commission has to deal with, uh, and that's in 865 uh, paragraph uh, 7, where the proposed annexation is in the best interest of the county as a whole. Uh, I guess I'm to assume that you're saying that this would not be in the best interest of the county as a whole. It would be our position that that factor fails as well as several of the others under the statute, yes. And what I'd like to ask you to do, can you identify for me what are the reasons why it would not be in the best interest of the county? Not, not the merchants, I'm talking about the county as a whole. Uh, not exhaustively, we've put a lot of them in writing for your consideration, but I can recall one, and I believe this came up when we were orally going back and forth, round one or round two, maybe both. I don't think, and nor do my clients think, nor do I suspect a lot of the people that you'll hear from later this evening think that it's in the best interest of Monongalia County if a prospective developer of a business comes to your economic development officials and say, there's some unincorporated territory here off 79. We're planning on making a substantial investment. We're going to build a warehouse. We're going to build this business or that business. We're going to employ a lot of people. But we need to know something. In order to make this a profitable, viable business that can employ people in and around Montegalia County, we need to know that we won't be involuntarily annexed into a municipal corporation. And if you do this tonight, and it was, uh, or whenever your vote is, and if it withstands judicial review, your economic development officials are going to have to give a pretty 
um, unfavorable answer to questions like that. That's one reason. This is unprecedented and it's a deterrent. It's a deterrent to development. Uh, are you familiar with the University uh, Town Center? Not in any, not, no, not, not in any dependable are way. I'm sure you know a lot more. Are you familiar with the gateway, the new development that went in there? I am not. Are you aware that they asked to be annexed into the city of Westover? Uh, oh, yes, yes. Business. I remember that's, that's documented in our submission. That's the way it's supposed to work. If you can, if a property owner wants to come into a municipal corporation, that's what the statutes facilitate. But, but I guess what I have problems with is your theory is that it's detrimental and an adverse. Why would a business want to come into the city of Western if it's that detrimental and that adverse to a developer? I don't speak for any other business. My, our clients talked to Westover about coming in when they were developing their property, and at that time it was, a, it was something that they were, wanted to consider positively, and they got the cold shoulder from Westover. I don't want to be understood to say that annexation is always bad. No one should, uh, anyone is senseless if they choose to have their property incorporated into a municipality. What I am here to tell you is it would be very detrimental to the reputation of Montegallia County in respect to future economic development if you take the unprecedented step of allowing a municipal cor corporation through a so-called minor boundary adjustment to grab a hundred acres with a fully developed shopping center that's been there for decades. And I guess my last question is, uh, help me to understand the difference that you would see, if any, between benefit to the county as a whole and benefit to the whole county? Um, I've, I've never uh, thought about that and I don't have any response. I don't know why those would necessarily be any different. Well, that's why I'm asking you, do you think there's a difference? In the abstract, I even want to answer the question. I'm not sure what you're, I mean, the, the statute Well, that's says, one of the factors that you have to consider to, you know, to the either get this whole. request approved or disapproved. And that's whether the proposed annexation is in the best interest of the county as a whole. Uh, right. The mall's position on that is, is, is there a difference between the county as a whole and the whole county? None that I can think of. The words of the statute are county as a whole. And I think the county as a whole, to use the one, not the only one, the one that I pull up of detriment, that would be detrimental to Montegallia County as a whole if it were to gain the reputation for authorizing this sort of a municipal annexation involuntarily as a so-called minor boundary adjustment under 865. But there are other additional reasons and I, you know, that we, went, we spent a lot of time going back and compiling this for your careful consideration rather than coming here and reading to you for three or four hours. I understand that. I, I'm, I'm just trying to get clarity on, I know having sat through two previous hearings, and very familiar with the proceedings. Uh, I know that, that that one question is a troubling question. Uh, whether or not you can take a position that, well, if Westover gets the annexation approved of the Morgantown Mall, then Blacksville will <laughs> suffer. Uh, then Granville will suffer because it's not a benefit to the whole county as a whole. It's a detriment and, and adverse. Uh, you're saying that, it, that developers wouldn't want to come into the county. So I'm assuming that you're implying they wouldn't come into anywhere in Montgate County because of Westover's annexation. Well, I, I think you have to uh, interpret the law and apply your policies uniformly. I hope you wouldn't just do this for Westover and deny it to anyone else. So yes, it would engender, t it would create a countywide reputation for unprecedented involuntary annexation. Unless you're gonna say this is the only time we're ever gonna do it. The, the one other question that I have is, is that uh, there seemed to be an issue on, on the cost that would be placed upon the merchants in the mall if this annexation were approved. Uh, it's gonna increase costs. Do you have any idea how much money they have saved over the last 20 years? Saved in what sense? And not By having not to pay taxes? No, taxes? no, that would depend upon their proprietary business information. I don't have any access to that. How about for the uh, Glimpser Corporation? How much money they have saved by not paying any B&O taxes? 
over the last I don't have that information. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Yes. Um, first, I want to thank you very much for, I guess, putting it in writing so you didn't have to go through it for three hours. You're welcome. Um, that's the only bad thing is now I'm going to have to do a lot more reading. Um, I am not privy to any information before this meeting, except the one we had a couple weeks ago. So I want to be that very clear. I've not even seen any of this, so I plan on looking at it. Thank you. Um, a couple of the questions I have, and it's more my big concern is, I'd like to hear from you specifically and publicly. Why do you think that this annexation does not meet the law by the minor boundary adjustment? I mean, I guess I, I'm probably going for half an hour, but you see, because that to me is one of the major stumbling blocks that I see. For example, um, okay, let me, let me preface it this way. The letter that you just read, uh, that you have on the front of our the August the 26th letter. Okay, uh, the August 26th letter. If I can ask, because I do not, I'm not no legalese, please explain the term, which was therefore an ultra virus act. So I, I can get a clarification of what that means right here. If you're considering the latter, then the Westover Council, to our knowledge, never approved the submission, which is therefore an Ultra Vires Act. Yes, could it's, you give uh, that in English for someone who's a lady? Uh, with, with, without proper authority to our knowledge. Uh, you heard Mayor Johnson earlier this evening describe Westover Council as a strong council and his mm -hmm. position as a, that of a weak mayor. When the initial application was submitted, it bore the same date as a resolution of the Westover City Council that was attached to it. When the so-called revised petition that corrected the misapprehension of the law that Westover acknowledged was, was submitted, I didn't see it submitted with any new resolution of the Westover Council. So I believe it's unclear and undemonstrated that the Westover Council has voted and authorized the resubmission of the so-called revised petition, given that there was a material mistake in it. We pointed that out. It was, uh, you know, we were, that was not accepted at the time, but quite soon thereafter it was. That's the only point of that part of that letter. Okay. Now, building, going back to the other question, does it meet the parameters of a minor boundary adjustment as by the state law? You believe it doesn't? I believe it does not. And, uh, and could you give me a specifics or, you know, three or four, rather than, you know, why? Because I'm going to ask the same question to their side of why they believe it does. I mean, and that's what I it's not an adjustment to a, a boundary in the sense and we went over this at great length and by the way we submitted with the letter and okay. audio the a recording yeah I saw there's a yeah we, yeah, we talked about that at some length there and I don't I'll try to say it as <laughs> non poorly as I might have okay. at that occasion but what we think a minor boundary adjustment is and, and I think it's, you know, we're not going to go find a, de a separate definition of any of those three or all of those three words put together in that phraseology in that or any other section of the West Virginia Code. We have to resort to basic English. Okay. To adjust a boundary, especially when the legislature made clear that Section 5 is the least preferable of 2 and 4. Mm -hmm. And you don't even think about using 5 unless you can show that it's just essentially a waste of Money. It's not cost effective to hold an election or expect people to go gather all the other peti the petitions under Section 4 when we can just go and tweak something. If we wanted to scooch out a municipal corporate boundary to coincide with a new highway, if there were a parcel or two, and I've dealt with both of these situations, if there were a, if there were a, a parcel or two that had a municipal boundary that bisected it. And it was needful either in the interest of the, of the municipal corporation or the owner of the property to be all in or all out, then voluntarily, consensually, they can come before a county commission such as this one and say, look, we just need to move this, uh, we just need to make a minor, as in small, adjustment to this boundary. To take the municipal boundaries of Westover, however may they lie, relative to over a hundred acres of developed, decades-long shopping center complex, 
throw a lasso around that whole area and claim that's a minor adjustment to a boundary? I just think that's facial nonsense. Those words have to mean something, especially when read some more Latin in paramateria or along with sections <coughs> two and four. Mm -hmm. This is not a minor boundary adjustment, plain English. It's never been tested and challenged and survived that kind of a challenge. Are there any parameters that the state law says what is and is not a minor boundary? No, the stat those terms, and Mr. Stranko, I think, has agreed with this when we were last before you, none of them is defined, right. and certainly the phrase as a whole is not defined. I say you, you, you fall back on looking at the body of law that's all of Chapter 8, Article 6, as well as basic common English, because that's the language the legislature used for all of our mm -hmm. statutes. My question is, if you have, say, 100 acres, but only one person owns it, would that be considered a minor boundary under your definition or not? See, that, that's where I'm having some difficulty. If it's just one or two people who own the property, whether it's uh, an acre or 200 acres, would, could that not be considered a minor boundary? Well, <laughs> if, if that uh, property owner came to you along with the municipality, uh, uh, and say voluntarily, in the context of all these other things, we, right. we'd have to look at a whole bunch of other factors. Would they be able to say, w would you have to refuse them because no, that's not a minor boundary adjustment, you have to have an election? I'm not going to tell you that that has to work that way. I'm here to defend my client against with the circumstances that it now faces. And in the context of this fully developed shopping center and an involuntary annexation that's, been, that's tried and failed the last two times, that's no minor boundary adjustment at all. Mm -hmm. May I ask then the same question, or should I just? Yeah, uh, well, uh, Mr. 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 Uh, Stryker. Stryker will have an opportunity oh, okay. for rebuttal, so you can oh, okay. ask I'll wait. once I'll you've completed. OK. Yeah. Um, one final question, if you mind. Um, in listening to uh, Chief Panico's arguments, I, um, he makes a good point, whether we want to agree or not, that it does seem illogical to have a police department which is right there, which is, should be able to respond whereby, again, I'm looking at a countywide, that if they could respond and that would be part of their jurisdiction, then the other sheriffs and deputies could be in other areas of the county, you know, patrolling. Mm -hmm. How would you argue that argument? I mean, when I'm looking at, again, what is in the best interest of the county. Well, if, that, if, sure. if that's the argument, and if that's, if that's all it takes to win that argument, pretty soon you won't have any sheriffs will be around sitting around playing cards because the municipalities will take as much as they want. I mean, how, how we, that, that argument just proves too much. You can't just say, well, we're right next door, mm -hmm. you're in. Well, then someone else is next door, and then they can come in. Mm -hmm. It's never been done that way. Okay. That's a legitimate argument. Okay. That's it. Thank you. I just got one question. Yes, sir. It's been the same question I've asked over and over. Whatever I do here, Revolves not about Westover or about the mall. Mm -hmm. It involves me adopting a standard, which the legislature has allowed me to do, that I can apply to Granville, which under a best interest standard, Granville should have been granted their annexation. That isn't what the question is. That's just one of the factors to be considered. What, a mind, what standard can I adopt that can apply in Kanawha County, in Huntington, <clears throat> in Parkersburg, in Martinsburg, in Star City? Or if there is no standard, is this just merely a political question and therefore no law need apply. Well, I'm, I'm afraid it, be, it, it could become a lawless, I hate to use the word politician in front of a body of people who at least would acknowledge they're politicians <laughs> every so often. But if it's about, 
we should be allowed to annex anything that we can tax more than we're going to have to spend to render public services, which is the argument you've heard tonight. It's not much of a standard. I don't think it's a good legal standard. Well, you can't give me any help with the standard. Well, I don't. I, the, the, if you get past, is this a minor boundary adjustment? If you get past the admonition that you can't even consider this unless you can show that it's, it, it's uh, you, you can't uh, <coughs> pursue the question through annexation election or petition effectively or efficiently, whatever those magic words are in 865. Cost effectively and efficiently. Yeah. If you, if you forgo all that and you get to the standard. No, that's the standard. That's the standard I'm looking for. That's the standard I'm looking for because that's where we have to get to before we get to all the other seven issues that's being presented. That's the standard. When does a petition meet those requirements of a minor boundary adjustment that could be fairly applied to a town of 40,000 people in Morgantown to a town of, I believe it's 4,000 4, 4, people in West Ontario, a town of 60,000 people in Charleston. It does not matter because we are applying state code. We're not applying something we wrote. We are applying state code. So what we apply here, the standard we adopt, for determining this is or is not a minor boundary adjustment under this 865. Oh, I, I, Must have equal applicability in every one of those towns in every county. That's been my difficulty throughout, throughout the whole thing. I think it's admirable for what Westover wants to do, but I, I, I gotta be true to the law. Well, if, if, if uh, I think that part of the statute does have to be consistently and clearly understood the legislature met but one thing when it enacted that statute and the fact that no one how many counties we have in west virginia 55 55 counties how many have ever how, how many of them have had to contend three times now with a municipality that tried to use this i, I appreciate that sir. yeah but, but no but, that, but i'm trying to get an answer to well, a simple question the answer is an no answer? other county has even been had, had to answer this silly question it's not, obviously it's not a minor boundary adjustment. Or you would have heard about other people using it over these years. But, but, but I still don't have a standard. In other words, if I hear what you're saying, you're saying, much like uh, the justice said, I don't want, uh, what was the quote, I don't know what pornography is, but uh, I know it when I see it or something. I can't tell you what pornography mm -hmm. is, but I know it when I see it. Well, basically you're telling me, <coughs> I don't know, and maybe that's my position, I don't know what a minor boundary adjustment is, <clears throat> but I know one when it is, and I know one when it is. And the only, I agree with that completely, and I think that's the way you have to approach it. You're not here to uh, recodify the law, but you are here to follow the law. And on these facts and circumstances, this petition, I don't think, and I think you correctly found as a body the last time around, that it didn't constitute a minor boundary adjustment. You only have to deal with them one at a time. This one is not. Thank you. I have nothing further. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mellon. You're very you welcome. Any, we appreciate your closing? time. Anything you want to add? If not, we're going to move on. No, wait, I, and thank now you. you'll spend more time on me reading all this stuff. Okay. Did you, thank did you. Did you want to bring Harry or anyone else up? No. It's, it's okay. Thank you, Mr. Mellon. Uh, Mr. Stranko, your turn. Thank you. President. Just very briefly, um, I'm going to address a couple of issues, and then my colleague's going to address the uh, the, uh, the uh, error issue and the correction. You know, in one of the last un unpleasant exchanges we had in front of the commission, Mr. Mellick accused me of misleading the commission, which I, I took exception to then and still do. Uh, but the fact is, what's misleading is treating this as some sort of run-of-the-mill tort case. We're talking about the future of our community here. We're talking about fair share. We're talking about cost of civic life. And you know, you can show your hand and you say, yeah, developers come into the town, they want to know, am I going to have a profitable and viable business? What, what would the developer also ask? What kind of quality of life will my employees have? I want to move into Westover with a business. What kind of quality of life are you going to provide for them? Well, there's no sidewalks. There's one crappy old park. I mean, can we do better? You know we can do better. 
Uh, that didn't come up in the conversation, the quality of life. When we hold up a straw man and say, and I, let me quote him, uh, uh, Westover comes out ahead. We're not talking about a, 90, a corporation that made $96 million in net profit last quarter like Glimpshire did. We're talking about 4,000 people in a community that have needs, that have needs for public service, that have needs for infrastructure today and well into the future. That's what we should be focusing on. Now, one other tactic that I, that I object to is holding up a, a straw man, making a false argument. I never suggested that any other mall property has been involuntarily annexed. The legislature specifically amended this statute to allow a county commission to annex property over the objections of property owners. Before this latest version of the statute, you could never do it. You had to have unanimous approval by both the business owners and the freeholders. The legislature changed that. Now you can, over the objections of the uh, uh, business owners, uh, order this uh, uh, annexation. And, and the petition that you, you've been given shows exactly what the problem is here, why we're talking past each other. Last sentence of the first paragraph. We feel the only beneficiary of the increase in revenues will be the city of Westover. Strike that. People of Westover. And not us, the merchants of the Morgantown Mall. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? We're talking about a community here, a community, a civic body that has to pull together to succeed in the decades to come. We haven't succeeded in the past. Nobody in the Westover government will tell you they're pleased with the condition of their city, but they are sure working hard at fixing it. So these arguments that, oh, the city comes out ahead, that's the people. When you talk about the city, you talk about the people. If you think anything different, uh, you've got the wrong focus. Secondly, I have never suggested there is a crime problem at the Morgantown Mall. That has been, uh, this is uh, not the first time that he's held that argument up. I've never suggested that. Um, what I have suggested and what the Chief of Police has just told you is that public safety would be promoted by the City of Westover annexing that mall into the city and his police force responsible for immediate response and for working with the business owners for loss prevention, for training, for the support they need that they're asking them for already. My goodness, how could I say there's a crime problem? There's not a crime problem there. What we're trying to do is protect the public safety. Westover comes out ahead. Ridiculous. The people come out ahead. The people come out ahead. <coughs> now, finally, this idea of uh, my legal fees. Well, actually, the legal fees for the firm. I, I, am not, I am not embarrassed by those fees. I'm proud of those fees. I work for every dollar. And every dollar gets looked at by that man right there and those counselors in the back of the room. I defend every dollar. I talk to him before I do any work for the city of Westover. This is new law. We are breaking ground here. It's hard. It's expensive. It's hard on us. We know it's hard on you, too. What reputation do we want Montague County to have? I appreciate Mr. Mellick's concern about our reputation, about our future development. The reputation we want to have in Westover is that we provide for the needs of all of our citizens. And that we provide a quality of life that is comparable to any city in the United States, any small town in the United States. We cannot say that now. We will say that in the future. Now, there are legal issues that Mr. Mellick uh, brought up. Uh, as a preface before I let uh, my colleague uh, talk to you about those, uh, uh, let me say that I thought the Commission already ruled on those threshold matters, and we were past that. But since that was brought up as issues, um, I'll let Mr. Simonton uh, uh, talk about the, the status of the law and the amended petition. Um, and then I'll, I'll reappear because I know you have uh, uh, questions for me. So, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. Mr. President and Commissioners, as Tim said, I'm just going to address those contentions regarding the uh, revised petitions and the, the proceedings under Council's resolution. Okay. I think uh, the first Please state your full name. I apologize, I know you're Mr. Mr. President. Like I'm, I'm Ryan Simonton, and I'm here representing the City of Westover. Thank you. Um, and the first thing I, I want to uh, represent is, as, as Tim just said, the revised petition was accepted by the Commission at its last meeting on August 7th for this public hearing was ordered. Um, I don't think there's any confusion in the record about whether that is the petition that's being proceeded upon. That revision corrected a technical <coughs> error that referred to qualified voters, which is a defined term in the statute. Uh, as we noted, it didn't impact any of the findings made by City Council in its resolution authorizing Mayor Johnson to proceed with this annexation. 
uh, City Council found that the proceedings under annexation by election or annexation by a petition of the owners of the property to be annexed would be an exercise in futility. And they closed that resolution by saying, it is further resolved that the mayor is hereby authorized to execute any and all papers necessary and make oral and written pleadings on behalf of the city of Westover to effectuate said minor boundary adjustment. Mayor Johnson's execution of the revised petition to, co to correct the technical error was an act according to that power. Uh, Glimpshire's representative have characterized that act as ultra vires, meaning beyond the powers of Mayor Johnson's office. office rather, uh, Council's resolution in that final paragraph clearly provides Mayor Johnson the power to make that written pleading uh, in pursuance of the minor boundary adjustment that Council authorized. I believe that addresses the issues uh, that I have for you, and I'll yield the podium to them. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Let, let me just, uh, yes, uh, one more point on that, uh, the, the threshold issue of whether it could be cost effectively or efficiently accomplished. At our last uh, get together, you got three letters, uh, November 09, December 09, January 10, that show that the mayor and I repeatedly tried to contact uh, Glimpshire in Columbus, Ohio, and ask them about annexation, promoted annexation as a good alternative for them, asked them to participate in the cost of our city government. Um, not only did they not say no, they didn't even respond. So when we had analyzed whether it was cost effective, efficient, or even possible to do it by either petition or election, both of those methods require the freeholders, the landowners, to vote in the majority for the petition. Two of the three freeholders weren't even talking to us, weren't even answering our letters, weren't answering our phone calls. So, uh, you know, it's beyond the pale to say, and really through the looking glass, to say, oh, well, they could have efficiently or effectively done it. And, and to make the fees, the money, the investment that Westover's made in this proceeding an issue in front of this commission, it's like an arsonist complaining about a fire fee. We could have had this done in 2009 if they would have acted like a responsible citizen and participated in the cost of our city government. Now, finally, the issue about minor boundary adjustment. Uh, I know you want to ask that question, Commissioner. Let me address it head on. The legislature could have very well defined minor. They could have very well defined minor boundary adjustment. What are the parameters? They didn't. What does that mean? That means not that you listen to Mr. Mellick's idea of what it means, not that you listen to my idea of what it means. You decide. The legislature has, in fact, delegated to you the authority to decide what a minor boundary adjustment is. And why did they do that? There are so many variables, so many compli complexities and complications in life, in local life, in local government, that the legislature could not have possibly incorporated all those considerations. What did they do? They relied on the wisdom of the county commissions who were adjudicating these applications to decide. They could have, again, very well defined it. They didn't. Not defining it means you get to define it. What is a minor boundary adjustment? We have three property owners. We have common activity. We have a commercial community center sitting right on top of the city of Westover. We have community activities going on up there all the time when it's in the mall's interest to be the community center. How could that not be? How could that not be a minor boundary adjustment? It is an integral part of our city. It's an integral part of our community. What's in it for me? What's in it for the mall? Let me tell you what's in it for the mall. Anybody can look up there and see that that area has been poorly managed, poorly managed, underdeveloped. We've got, we've got Lots grown with weeds. We've got South Dance Run that's nothing but uh, burned out building, uh, abandoned buildings. This 20,000 cars a day pass there. What's lacking? What's lacking? Leadership. Leadership. Planning and public participation. How do you get that? Through municipal government. So what's in it for me? I would say to Mr. Grandin and his, his friends at the mall, what's in it for you is a better future. Undoubtedly, a better future as a full partner in local government. I'll pause and uh, uh, answer your question, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Stranko. Um, uh, Commissioner Bartolo, you have any questions? Yes, I have a, I, Mr. Stranko, I'd like to ask you hopefully a very similar question that I asked uh, Mr. Mellick. Uh, <coughs> one of the main items of concern in making a decision on the annexation is whether it's in the best interest of the county as a whole. And I would just like to ask you, do you see the concept 
of what's in the best interest of the county as a whole differently than what's in the best interest of the whole county? I don't. I have to agree with Mr. Mellick's uh, answer there. I see it as the same thing. And let me tell you that uh, it, there's not a wall around Westover. We make Westover a walkable, bikeable city. We put public facilities in there that people can enjoy. We don't exclude anybody. Just like the city of Morgan doesn't, doesn't exclude Westover citizens from their facilities. So as a county as a whole, the whole county can enjoy a better urban core and a well-managed, well-financed city. The uh, other question, and Mr. Millick made a statement that uh, he felt that if the forced annexation would be a detriment to developers coming into the area, and I would just like to have your position on would the annexation by Westover, uh, why would it not be a detriment to developers coming into the area? When a company, the kind of companies we want to attract, let's start there. What kind of developer are we talking about? Are we talking about a high volume manufacturer? No, that's not what we want here. We want to spin off the, the brain power we have down the street here at the university and develop a high tech, high intelligence workforce. Now, when those companies come, when Microsoft comes to Morgantown or to Westover and says, well, I, I'm thinking about developing here, praise the Lord, right? Well, what kind of quality of life can you provide for our, our employees? We're talking about responsible developers, responsible business owners that don't just ask the questions Mr. Mellick posed, how can I have a profitable and viable business? They're talking about, how can you help me care for my employees? How can you help me attract and keep my employees? I appreciate the President's concern about, about uh, statewide precedent, but that's not your job, uh, Mr. President, respectfully. Your job is to protect the best <coughs> interests of Monongahela County, both generally and specifically in this statute. And we believe that developers coming to this town, this county, need to know that we expect them to be full partners in local government. That just doesn't mean the cost. That also means you come and you tell us what you need, and we'll get it for you. You need loss control, we'll get it for you. You need better uh, public facilities, we'll get them for you. That's what we want developers to learn about Montague County. Not that you can come in here and, and not give a damn about the quality of life of your employees. You're going to come here and care about all of our people. And you're going to participate in the cost of caring for those people. I, uh, is Chief Panico going to have a few words to say here at the end? I have a couple questions. He's always got something to say, uh, Commissioner. <laughs> And I do have one question, and maybe the, the mayor or, or someone else has to answer it if you can. But what does it mean to a merchant in the mall to have to pay a B&O tax? Let's say that this annexation is approved, uh, and I'm a merchant in, in the mall. What, what are we talking about in tangible dollars and cents and expenses? What, what is the B&O rate? So for every hundred dollars retail, it would mean that the merchant would have to pay an additional fifty cents. Okay. And to go, to take that a little further, uh, uh, well, now I'll, I'll leave it at that. It's fifty cents on a hundred dollars. It's a mercantile tax. Do we like the tax? No, but it's the way the state has and is funding municipal government. So it is what it is, Commissioner. The the. Uh, and I and maybe I should ask you this, uh, or the mayor, but the markup, the gross, the profit markup on most retailers, uh, we're talking about fifty cents on a dollar. We're we're talking about five percent. I mean, on a hundred, five percent. Point zero five. Zero five percent. Zero five. Uh, what would you say is the fair market profit on a hundred dollars for a merchant? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a very good businessman. Okay. Uh, there are businessmen in the room that maybe would be able to answer that. Maybe Harry can venture an opinion. Do you have one? I'm not a retailer. Uh, I, I don't know, Commissioner. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. That's all right. I just thought I'd ask if you had the answer. Uh, I, I would say, though, Commissioner, that 50 cents on $100, if that puts you out of business, you're pretty close to out already. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Uh, first of all, Mr. Symington, thank you for responding. Now I have two different versions of whether it meets the Ultra Virus Act or not, but at least I have an, a better understanding, so I don't have to ask that question. 
Mr. Strank, I do want to ask the same question, though. Are there any parameters that the state gave us to state what a minor boundary is? No, sir. No, sir. So why do you think your petition meets the minor boundary? Because it's, uh, we don't manage property by square foot. We don't serve property by the square foot. We serve property by the activity. And we address property owners. There are, really, we're talking about three, three parcels, one very small parcel owned by Lowe's and the two parcels owned by Glempshire. Common activity, three owners. It is a simple process for that area to be incorporated into the city of Westover. Now, if we were talking about a, a, a equal size parcel full of uh, residential uh, uh, and uh, 200 business owners, I would, I would hesitate to say that we're talking about a minor boundary adjustment. But here we're talking about three property owners, two of which are the same, and a common activity. That's why we believe it's a minor boundary adjustment. Okay. Now, to go to the, against the arguments, I want to get clear again. They do not feel that you met the standards of whatever that code is to go to this minor boundary adjustment. And I want to get a clarification. You're stating, again, what are the two reasons why you couldn't do the other? Because you said two of the three freeholders did not respond, but that doesn't say anything in the state law. Just because they don't respond, that doesn't mean that that's an answer. So yes, I'd, I'd like to see how you respond. We struggle with this statute, and we have, and we've had this conversation before about how poorly written this statute is. Mm -hmm. It's a bad piece of sausage. We all agree on that. I think even Mr. Malik would agree on that. Of course, he parses it in favor of the mall. I'm parsing it in favor of the people of Westover. So the question is, it's in uh, 865D. You have to decide whether the annexation could be efficiently and cost-effectively accomplished under the other two sections. That's not for the city council to decide, that's for you to decide. It says here, the county commission shall determine whether the application meets the threshold requirements and whether the annexation could efficiently and cost effectively be accomplished by the other two methods. And I've discussed uh, and given you evidence that shows that they weren't even <coughs> talking to us. They refused to talk to us. That was before Mr. I even met Mr. Mellick. That was when we were dealing with Mr. Kovach, the corporate counsel in Columbus. So, how could you conclude otherwise? Can this be accomplished? Well, if one of the crucial parties refuses to even talk about the possibility of annexation by election or petition, then how could it be cost efficiently and cost effectively accomplished? They wouldn't even engage. And you have the proof. So therefore, you can fairly conclude that neither of the other methods are available because they refuse. Now, let me add that the, the, the last change, legislative change in 865, which happened in uh, 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 2001, they amended this to allow, as I said earlier, to allow you to order annexation over the objection of the property owners. Why would they do that? If, if the petition and the election were already available, why would they do that? They did that because they realized there are cases in which a county commission may look at an annexation, reject, not reject, uh, weigh the objections against the benefits for the whole county and come down in favor of the annexation. And that's what we're asking you to do. Yes, we have objections. Yes, we have objections. Clearly, we do. Because nobody wants to pay more taxes. Do you have when that amendment was? 2001. Yes, sir. And uh, yeah. there was a memo on one of the past records, but uh, it's <coughs> we're in a whole new proceeding. I'll submit a uh, post-hearing a memo with the legislative history and we have some interviews from people that participated in those negotiations. So um, you have really pretty good legislative history available about what the legislature was thinking. Okay. Uh, now, again, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Uh, I could understand if I owned a property and I chose not to talk to you, that wouldn't mean that it's efficiently cost effectively. I just didn't want to be a part of the annexation. So I can understand that side of the argument, too. Sure. So, um, that is one of my ma that's a, that is one of my major concerns. Uh, the other concern, and again, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but as a county commissioner, and I think all three of us have to decide what's in the best interest of the citizens of Montague County. And please don't take this the wrong way, but I'm not here as a county commissioner to bail out Westover, nor do I see in my role to do that. I'm going to look at the bigger picture which is the quality of life and services, whether you're on one side of 
the city or the other side of the city or you know where you are in Montague County. So I just want to get it clear that whenever I make my decision, I'm not going to do it just because it's in the best interest of what I saw just because of Westover, but what Westover can provide for those individuals and what this could also provide for the rest of the county. And I'm not convinced either way yet. So, it's, a, it's a tough onion to peel, Commissioner, right. uh, but uh, yeah, I would ask you to recall that people Westover are also citizens of Montegallo County, uh, um, and Westover's not here asking you to bail them out. Westover's here asking that all of the businesses in our community participate in the cost of civic life. Right. And, and those businesses are clearly in our community. And I do agree with that. I have, a, I have a strong concerns when you just build property developers build property right outside the city and use all the residents of the city to benefit their projects. So again, I, I see both sides. So with that, I'll, I'll be quiet and I'll turn it over to you. Well, Mr. Schrenko, you stood up there and you answered my question thoroughly and completely. Uh, so I didn't think I was going to have to ask a question, but you didn't stop there. <laughs> <laughs> so you should have just stopped. Yes, sir. Okay. It's a problem I have. Yeah, now you either totally under, misunderstood the question I posed, or you twisted it uh, intentionally or otherwise. My question, to make it clear, is not about caring about anything but what is in the best interest of modern gay county. My question was, can you give me a standard? If I, County Commissioner, Montague County, can take, as County Commissioner in Kanawha County, can take, as Commissioner in Cabo County, and use that same standard. I wasn't saying, and you had to go that extra <coughs> step, I don't know if it was intentional or you just misunderstood me, that I care well, I can't say I don't care, I care about everybody, but that I am thinking anything about any of these other counties or about any other issue except Westover. Now, as a county commissioner here, and I have no intention of moving, this will probably be the only place I'll be county commissioner. <laughs> so I've got at least five towns that I've got to worry about that I apply equally and fairly to. So I think you're very improper by saying that I was concerned about other counties instead of about Westover. I am very concerned about Westover. I find your plans and ideas admirable. I have always said that. I have no animosity towards Westover. And Westover, if, they, if they're true, they will understand they should have no animosity to me. I'm doing what I believe is right. And I am sitting here and listening and trying to see, trying to be convinced. Okay. I am not, and I hope you believe that. I hope everyone believes that. I want to be convinced. Let me uh, answer the question. First of all, let me apologize for misunderstanding your position, Mr. President. Let me answer it two ways. Uh, first of all, this, uh, this is a terrible system. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, for uh, uh, what is our vision for the future? Uh, it, it, what I tried to float in the legislature last year, and it didn't, we got all tangled up in home rules, so we didn't get anywhere with it, is, is that the county would set an urban growth boundary. So I think when you think about municipal boundaries, think about the urban core of our county, and where do we want that to be in 2040? Where do we draw those lines? Because drawing an urban growth boundary would allow us to manage our resources and focus the incoming population in that urban area and also protect our green space and farms out in the, in the balance of the county. So uh, the first answer is we're under a, a, a bad system here and a better system. Uh, um, what you're entitled to consider is what's our county going to look like in 2040? We believe that Westover is going to run from the gateway all the way to the mall on that side and you're going to see significant, that side of the interstate, the west side, you will see significant development along that west side of the interstate. It's starting to happen already. You know better than I do. Um, so that's our future, I think. Uh, so uh, that's one answer to the question. The other <coughs> answer, a better and more uh, applicable answer is that every city has got to come to you, if they choose to come to you, to propose a boundary minor boundary adjustment and address 
um, uh, these seven issues that are listed under 865C that we've talked about and beat the horse Early, to, yeah. to, to <laughs> Yes, sir. So the standard is simply that we, we've created a record. You look at the facts in the record, apply them to each of those seven, uh, uh, seven uh, elements and make a decision. Uh, and as we go through those seven elements, the only one that's in question, the only two that are in question is whether uh, uh, who opposes or who uh, doesn't oppose um, the, the proposed annexation and uh, whether it's in the best interest of the county as a whole. So we look at the facts that are presented and make that determination. Uh, so it is a hybrid, political decision, judicial decision, uh, and the legislature dumped it on you. I'm sorry they did, Mr. President. They dumped it on you. And maybe they've done a better job of fixing it before they dumped it on us. <laughs> maybe, in the, on maybe, in the out, maybe in the out years we can fix it. But we've got the law we have right now. Well, you and I are on both, both on the same side. I think we're all on that side. Yes, it sir. needs to be fixed terribly. The ambiguity in the statute can be resolved. There's only one way to resolve the ambiguity in the statute, by your good judgment. By your good judgment and the facts we've presented to you. And we trust that judgment. Thank you, Mr. Schreiner. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay. Uh, we now move on to the public comment portion of our public hearing. Uh, just to determine how many people are, would you please raise your hand, uh, how many people are here to uh, speak in support of the petition? One, two, three, four. Four, okay. How many people are here to speak in opposition of the position? One, two, three, okay. Uh, I think I am going to try, let's say 40. Uh, I, I want to try to uh, eliminate or, or limit everyone to three minutes. Um, Maybe we ought to deal with, with an issue before we open the public. Are, are we going to uh, um, uh, are we going to do like we did the last time for us and allow them to submit any written uh, things until sure. like Monday or something sure. like that? I, th I think we can do that. Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be great. And I would just want to remind you, I would like to uh, ask uh, Chief Benico some questions. Oh, I'm sorry. You did mention that. You had a question. Okay. Um, we do that before, that? before yeah. we, uh, uh, I stand corrected. Thank you, sir. Um, before we move on to the public comment section, uh, we, we, we will give anyone uh, an opportunity. We'll keep the record open until Monday evening, next Monday evening. I don't know what that date is. The 9th, uh, Monday the 9th, uh, the close of business Monday the 9th to submit any additional written or documentation or any letters or anything that anyone wants to submit. That's when we'll close the record. Um, then uh, we will have the public comment section after we complete this. Uh, Chief Panico, do you, you mind? Uh, uh, Commissioner Bartolo has some questions. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit more about the public safety aspect. Yes, sir. And, and the uh, jurisdictional uh, response at the mall. Um, as I understand it, there's a mutual agreement that if the Sheriff's Department would call you, then you would respond. Generally, Westo yes, sir. And it's almost, it would be morally improper for you to refuse to respond. You would have to put a leash on some of my officers to stop them. Uh, they would go you, there because they know it's the right thing to do. An officer would be in trouble, uh, or, or a member of the public would be in trouble. Yes, sir. No doubt about it. Uh, I know that you have a history of uh, law enforcement as well as the military involvement. Yes, sir. Uh, sometimes people who don't have that insight uh, don't look at response time as being important. Uh, can you explain to us why response time by a police officer to a situation where why that's critical to the welfare and safety of the public? I'll try, sir. Um, in all cases, when something happens and somebody suffers an injustice or they get, they're in danger, they feel a threat, they're going to call a police officer, and a police officer is going to get a call on 911, and we're going to get it on the radio. And we start getting information as we move towards that threat from 911 based on what this caller sees or what a witness sees. 
the time it takes for, just picture it yourself, the time for it takes for you to actually pick up something and strike somebody, or be, you'd be struck by something by somebody, is basically called reaction time. Uh, we're talking seconds, minutes, at, at worst case, minutes, that you have time to run and maybe hide enough. The, the officer that picks this call up, say he's over on um, Great Green Bag Road, and he's got the call because other officers are tied up. What he's going to get to is an after action. He's going to come to something that's already happened, which means that he's going to have to take time and resources to gather information and evidence to support his case in court because it's after the fact. Response time makes us go back and double our work now. It's going to take more officers. It's going to take more, more of our time and, and, and energy and resources and investigations as opposed to an officer that's right next to the mall on Mall Road, not coming from Green Bag Road. As soon as we get that call, we can actually respond to this before after action. We can step on it or stop it or contain it before it happens, and then we can sort it out before it might even have to get to court. It might not have to go to court, but it's something that we picked up within that, that first initial response time of, say, 35 seconds to two minutes in that area there is when we usually respond. From that time frame there, we can be there fast enough as opposed to somebody that's not there, and we can basically put a hammer on this to where we say, we don't have to make an arrest. There's nobody going to be hurt. And here's the big thing. If the people up there that go up there to commit crimes know that we have a fast response time, they're going to find some other place to do it that doesn't have a fast response time. And I can tell you right now, based on my talk with the vendors up there, they have told me the concern is this. They know the sheriffs will come. They know the state police will come. It's just that they don't know when they'll come. As a result of that, we tend to agree with the sheriff's department. We try to go up there and grab it and give them that information. I got to tell you, that's not fair to the citizens of Westover because they pay us to do the job in Westover. So the answer to your question, response time means the difference between somebody actually going to the hospital, getting hurt, assaulted, robbed, or us getting up before it happens and, and, and try to sort it out to where we might not have to interfere and put somebody in jail. Or if we do, we have enough information there to put the person in jail and arrest them and take them through the civil process or the legal process. Is it, a, is it a real possibility, as the present circumstances are, that a call could come in, deputy sheriff could be assigned to go up there, state police could have no one on, uh, as sometimes they do, yes, sir. and the sheriff's department takes the calls, and the sheriff's department uh, doesn't has a deputy available, but is it, he's at the Morgantown Mall and the calls at Blacksville. Mm -hmm. uh, so it takes approximately 30, 35 minutes. Yes, sir. Uh, does that increase the probability of loss of life, of personal injury? Tenfold. 35 minutes? Tenfold. You're talking about somebody that's going to commit a crime and actually has time to clean up and get away with it and leave the area, which has happened several times to us before. Because, again, not to fault the Sheriff's Department or State Police, they just don't have the manpower to respond to a particular area at one time with everything they need. So, yes, it will tenfold increase the problem, and it's going to, of course, uh, again, make you take resources from the street and, and take these other deputies out looking for these people that's already committed a crime. And generally speaking, it's because most of these criminals <coughs> know that it does take a longer response time. The sheriff knows how long it takes to get to Blacksville. They've actually had to take resources and stage them in Blacksville because of this, so he's responding to that properly. There's never enough to do what we need to do. Uh, we, we get by with what we can, but we're saying we're there already. It's just a step. It's just another minute for us as opposed to 10. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. No. You're good. Okay, we now open up to public comment. We're going to limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, please come forward. Uh, uh, I'm Al Yoakum. I, live, of course, live in Westover, have for um, 30, 40 years. Uh, I'm also a member of Westover City Council and chairman of the Finance Committee. And uh, being chairman of the Finance Committee, myself and other councilmen, we prepare a budget every year uh, with the funds that we have. And, uh, and I've been a councilman for a number of years, and I've always wondered why the Morgantown Mall didn't contribute something to the city of Westover, because they certainly used our, our manpower and resources as far as the police department goes. I see accidents at Christmas time when there's heavy traffic all the time and our police are responding. And I always wondered why the Morgantown Mall didn't, didn't uh, give something back to the city. I myself spend a couple thousand dollars up at that mall every year, 
I get nothing back. The city gets nothing back uh, for me spending money at the mall. So I might as well go to Grafton and spend it. Uh, probably be better off. So it's, it's sort of not, in my opinion, they're not treating the city as, as a, a proper citizen themselves. Uh, they're, they're up there to make their money and go on down the road. Um, and like I said, being on the budget committee, there's been several years that we've had a hard time just getting enough money together to pay for basic services, let alone improving the quality of life to the citizens of Westover. We just haven't had enough of funds to do that. Now, hopefully, if, uh, if this uh, mall thing comes to bloom for the city of Westover, we'll have money. We'll have money to build some sidewalks. We'll have money to improve our streets. We'll have money to take care of our stormwater problems that we have all over town. So I encourage the commission to vote for our annexation of the mall for those, those reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gill. Uh, who's next? If you move on up here, the people that are in favor of it. I thought a gentleman was moving up. So we don't take all night. Who's next to speak for? We have anyone else that wants to speak for the annexation? In favor of the petition. Last call. Anyone else? Okay. All right. We close that portion. Anyone that wishes to speak <coughs> in opposition to the petition? Mr. Sell. You need to come up there for the mic. It, it, the time doesn't start until you open your first uh, syllable. <laughs> Could I ask for it not to start until I get one question answered? Yes, if you have a procedure question, yes, sir. Okay. I uh, recently hand-delivered to your offices uh, a letter incorporating by reference all of the things I've previously said through your first two exercises and uh, the, all of the documents that I've submitted, may I be assured that those are going to be into the permanent record of this procedure? They should be. You have those? Okay. And, and you're presenting that. Did you say there was a bunch of attachments to it too? Oh, yes, several. You're going to transfer, you're going to, by reference, you're going to transfer it from the prior because we, we put it in the last hearing. So you're, you're going to transfer those to this record. Right. I just want to know. Well, we, we also need it because Tom. I need to. Yeah, and I need to. Because he didn't have a chance to read it. Yeah. We got, it. we got a chance to read it, but he had it. Right. Okay. So, so that, that will be. That's all going to be part of the permanent record of yes, this proceeding. Yes. That's what I was Thank saying. You. I just wanted to get it on the record. Okay, now if you'd like to start the clock, sir. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> during one of your earlier public hearings on this uh, matter, uh, Mr. Stranko readily agreed with me that uh, the treatment of the property owners uh, of the property in question has been shabby throughout the history of them all being there. That shabbiness started October 11th, 1989. Um, I've documented for you previously the fact that after the property owners spent a million dollars to acquire the first 80 acres that they bought up there, the then mayor of Westover asked them on that date, do you still intend to build them all? He was chairing the sewer board, a sewer board meeting at the time. Who in the world would spend a million dollars just for land, and that wasn't all the land they bought, and not have an intention to do the project that they said they were going to do? In Westover, a lack of development is because government is its own worst enemy and has been for over 30 years. That's well documented in the documents I've given you. I'm going to give you another specific example. We at one time had an industrial zone along the Monongahela River that ran from above the Westover Bridge 
all the way down to Dance Run and then made a left up Dance Run and ran all the way up uh, to uh, 19 South. Our city council changed the zoning of that. It's no longer an industrial zone. <clears throat> Our city council didn't go out and do the things that a responsible city council would do to entice people, industrial representatives, to come in and build in that zone. The zone, now in the meantime, our city council prevailed upon the state to give us a very substantial amount of money to help build an industrial bypass road down through there. And now the industrial zone, just a few years after that, was done away with by our government. What was the point of it all? Ask them how many new businesses have moved into that zone uh, subsequent to the change in the zone. Ask them for a list of them. You'll be appalled, okay? I came here tonight and heard the, the legal expense bill for these three exercises. Well, two of them anyway. You, you need to wrap up, sir. Okay, I will very soon. <coughs> I'm appalled because we've apparently invested over $60,000 of my tax money and my fellow taxpayers' money in an exercise in forum shopping. And you know, Mr. President, because you're an attorney, exactly what I'm talking about. All right? It's been forum shopping. And the other thing that I'm appalled that I didn't hear tonight is any semblance, any reference to, any cost-benefit analysis that my city government has done with regard to its successful annexation of the gateway and all that property along I-79. They're very proud of what they're doing, but where is the cost-benefit analysis? Those are the kinds of failures our government has in West Virginia. I'll wrap up, sir. I just did. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anyone else present to speak uh, in opposition to the... Uh, petition. Anyone else here to speak in opposition to the petition? Okay, hearing none, we finish that por the public comment portion. Okay, I, th I think we're, we're completed. Uh, we've agreed that uh, the record will remain open for anyone else, and that needs to be made public to the newspaper and everything till Monday evening. Yes, sir. Mr. President, the, uh, the slides that we presented tonight and the, the, back, the yeah. backing data is in that briefing that book, book. Yeah, so we'd yeah, like that in the record as well. Yes. Uh, make sure that becomes a part of the official. She okay, she's copy. already got it. Yes, I, okay. I would also like a copy. Monday is the end of work day for you guys. Well, clo close the work. I don't know if you fax it in before midnight on 12, <laughs> uh, at 12 o'clock, we'll, we'll count it, you know. So what time do you leave the office, is my question. Five well, o'clock. Five, five o'clock. Five o'clock is five five normally, normally, yeah. Five o'clock normally. You did say... Uh, What's that? Sorry. I have five emails. Oh, okay. We got five emails in opposition. Can you read who those are from? not only part of the record to make sure that uh, yes. commissioners have a copy of those. Could I also have a copy of the section, you know, that Mr. Bartol was reading from again, the, six, the actual code? The six. They gave it to you last week. It should be in your file okay. or, or a few weeks ago that says Westover Annexation okay. number three. Number three. And okay. it should have Tom right there. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the one that says blue? It's right in there. <laughs> Diane was all set for it. Okay, thank if you. If you have trouble finding it, I'll make a copy of okay. it. Okay. The, the other question, <laughs> the other comment I would like to see, I requested from you all a copy about the, uh, when the uh, law was amended. And so I'd like to see that specifically. 
That to me is very important. That was 2001, wasn't it? Right. Yes, sir. I think so. Yeah. See, that was the year after I left city council. So that's why that changes some things for me. Okay. Yeah, I, I hope we can all work together to fix this. Yeah. It would solve a whole lot of problems. Uh, Mr. Yes, President, I would uh, like to see us set a date on when we will meet to, to deliberate and discuss a decision in this matter. Uh, I was hoping to do it next Wednesday, yeah, but maybe that's well, a good point I, to discuss that. Well, I would like at least two, I at least need two weeks, and the reason why is because next week is my that's fine. federal hearing. I'm, I'm not suggesting oh, what the time frame be, uh, how about but three, yeah. th three weeks is three fine. Week, no longer than three weeks. My concern is that I have the federal hearing next Thursday. Do you have a Thursday. date on the calendar three weeks from today? Yes, because I'm... You want, you want three weeks? You I want honest, full three weeks? No. You, you need, you need, if you need it? Yes, I need three weeks. Uh, to be honest, I, if, to, do, to be fair, to read all the material, I could not read it three all weeks. in time. Three weeks. What I would suggest, okay. then, Mr. President, is that we ask Diane put that on the agenda for September 25th. Yes. Uh, yeah. The decision making. 25th. Again. That gives me enough time to read. Yeah, I, I'm sorry I didn't think about no, all the reading you have to do because most of this was rereading <laughs> yeah, the same yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah love. I understand. Um, well, well, with that, with that, that, then maybe we ought to leave the record open to the Monday before because it doesn't really make any difference if they want to send in a letter or not. Uh, the Monday before the 25th, because what I mean, it doesn't make any sense to go ahead and close the record and then wait two more weeks. The the only uh, the only concern I have about that is that uh, you know, and I go back to Judge Joe's decision that. Uh, if people don't come to the public hearing, it means they don't care. Uh, that was his interpretation. And if, you know, it's publicized, there's people here this evening, uh, you know, uh, emails, I have a lot of trouble with credibility and uh, validating because we don't really know who they came from. Uh, uh, I, I do respect people when they come in person and, and uh, voice their, their opinion. And that's the purpose of the public hearing. And I don't, I really don't want to undermine the public hearing. We accepted all the evidence into the record. We're, we've already said we'd go to Monday. I, I think we've. Uh, that's fine. Oh, we don't have to change time. Yeah. I, I, was, I was just trying to be. Monday, yeah. People that know me try to be <laughs> up, up mostly fair. I know. That's why. That's why I got to say, quit being a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it'd I, be I fair. To... Yeah, I think it'd be unfair to any party who would get some letter where the other side couldn't respond to. So I think with Monday at five o'clock, everyone knows exactly the time. Okay, Monday at five o'clock. That's great. Uh, and, and, but, but you know, I I, that, I'm doing. also thinking about people that are working. Yeah, there are a lot of people that are working this is right only now. Wednesday. Huh? This is only Wednesday. Well, why? Well, well, I know uh, people were working where we ate before we came to the meeting. <laughs> They had to clean up after us, so they're, they all, from they couldn't they're all from Grafton. <laughs> they're from Grafton. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we, try, we try to have a good time whenever we can. Okay, uh, so we addressed all the issues. To the media, I understand the record will stay open for any written submission till Monday, uh, and we will schedule uh, uh, the, the final discussion, there won't be a hearing, the final discussion among the commissioners uh, for September 25th. One, one comment. As soon as we find out um, when this is going to be shown, we'll call the media and the newspaper so if, if you could put in the paper so people could watch the film knowing what time it is or tape it. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. That's fine. That will be good. Yeah. Uh, any, any, uh, any other issues we need to deal with? I would move that we uh, adjourn and close our meeting. I second that motion. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, motion passed. We're adjourned. Thank you all. You have a nice day.